been teaching for, here for the last 25 years, art history, and many of the foundation art courses. So my approach tonight is I am going to talk about some of the characteristics that I think you can begin to recognize early on in children that are interested in the arts. And for any arts, the aptitudes seem to manifest themselves early. So what I'm going to do is sort of two-prong. I'm going to talk about how it emerged in my own life, and then I'm going to talk about how you may be able to foster it in young children, middle school, high school kids, and then how we work with the college students here at Notre Dame to encourage and help them put together a portfolio when they're seniors and get a job. So uh, I'm going to talk about that, but I wanted to see this quote first um, because I think it's really important in the visual arts. That idea of seeing is critical in the visual arts. So it's not just the seeing, but what you do with the vision. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. This is Paul Valerie. He is the author of the quote. Uh, he was a French philosopher and poet. And I love that quote. I remember it very early on in my own career. I'll come back to it um, later in the presentation. But I'm... anyone recognize this fresco? Has anyone ever seen this before? Does it look familiar at all? It's a really famous painting by a high renaissance artist named Raphael. Uh, it is in the papal apartments in uh, the Vatican, in Rome. And I wanted to show it to you because it's very important to understand that the arts were not always included in education. And, and particularly not in a liberal arts education when we think of it today. So I wanted to include this so you can see where this idea of the arts being important to a holistic uh, approach to education it goes all the way back to the Renaissance period. And it's interesting because this is called the School of Athens, and Raphael is referring to those ancient Greeks who seem to do everything in a superior way. And he is Raphael, as an artist in the High Renaissance period, is saying, we Italians are heirs to this ancient Greek world. We aspire to all of the discipline and characteristics that, that they have. So this represents this whole pantheon of learning that the ancient Greeks um, really um, propagated throughout the Western civilization. But Raphael has included his own self-portrait over here. This little guy right over here is Raphael. He's also included his contemporaries, Da Vinci, who you probably recognize uh, as one of the great uh, high renaissance artists. And down here is Michelangelo, another contemporary of Raphael and Da Vinci. So what I wanted to tell you about these three is they worked with their hands, uh, they worked with their eyes, obviously, but they also believed the artist needed to have a great mind, and a mind <coughs> that was open and exposed to all different disciplines. So these three artists in particular really advocated for the arts to be included in the educational system. Now at that time it was really different from ours, but what they were saying is mathematics obviously is important, theology, rhetoric, uh, astronomy, uh, science, those are important, but so are the visual arts. So they were some of the first who advocated for the arts being included in holistic education. And, and I think that's really very important for you to see. It wasn't always that way. So without these guys, I probably wouldn't be standing here before you tonight. Now, I'm also going to include another artist, same time period, Velázquez who was a Spanish court painter. I bet you know this work that's coming up. Did anyone see this before? It's a really famous painting by Velázquez. He was the court painter for Philip II. Also a very learned artist. He hung out with princes and kings. He was an ambassador, a very learned man. And he also advocated for the arts to be included 
in a more holistic way in education. He, he, I mean, he really pushed it. And what's interesting in this painting, you see that he's wearing this red cross. This is a sort of a knighthood order in Spain at the time. Now Velasquez painted this painting, and then he went back. Um, I think uh, you know maybe uh, four years later, after he had painted this original painting, and he actually painted the emblem on the front of his um, his jacket because he was so proud that he had achieved this educational and scholarly and knightly recognition in his own society. And Spain was really much further behind in terms of, you know, sort of advanced uh, educational thinking, further behind than Italy at the time. So those artists are really important for the inclusion of the arts. And then I also have to say, this woman, an 18th century, um, she was actually from Switzerland, but she sort of traveled all over Europe. Angelica Kaufman is critical for me standing here because women were excluded from the arts almost completely up until about the 1700s, a few earlier than that. Um, but Angelica Kaufman, this is a self-portrait of her, and she is um, debating on whether she should pursue a career in music so you see she's got a musical score there, or the visual arts. And this is, this is a self-portrait that she painted when she was still a teenager, trying to make this weighty decision on what she should do with her future. Now, she also really advocated for the arts, and I, you know, again, it's because of these early pioneers that we can say the arts are even included in the, um, the educational programs today. Um, You okay with the lights out? Yeah? Okay. Um, in my own pursuit, um, I'm going to tell you, and you probably, I mean, to try and recall your own childhood, some of the meanings that you had when you were a kid. <coughs> you may have really loved music or you had a real gift for language as a kid. Um, some of those things need to be, first of all, recognized. And as a young child, you really can't recognize it in yourself. So it might be a parent or an early teacher that recognizes an aptitude that you have. And it may be an aptitude for the visual arts. So in my case, I think it probably manifested itself pretty early on. I mean, I used to do things like follow ants along the sidewalk because I was really interested in what those ants were doing, you know. I didn't care that my mother was going to yell at me for scuffing out my shoes because I really wanted to follow those ants. Or, you know, I used to do things like pick up mushrooms, and I, my mother still laughs at this story. Um, I was really little, I must have been about three, uh, and I picked up a mushroom because I wanted, I wanted to investigate this object. I wanted to feel it, smell it, look at the shapes. But my mother was watching me out of the window and yelled at me, drop that. And I was so scared that I stuck it in my mouth and swallowed it. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like probably three years old and I ended up in the doctor's office and they had to like, you know, pump my stomach to get the mushroom out. I don't think it was poisonous, but who knows. But it was that the early interest in the natural, tangible world. I had to touch it, smell it, see it and explored in all of its physical properties. And that I, I can recall very, very early on. And lucky for me, my parents um, encouraged that to a degree uh, until I got in high school and I really messed up my mother's kitchen a lot because I wasn't cooking, I was doing experiments on the stove, like tie-dyeing and fatiguing, and then I would forget to clean up. But you know, we have wax all over it, and so my mother wasn't real happy. But they, my parents still encouraged that inclination that I had towards exploring and experimenting, you know, working with materials, and um, they always provided me with the raw materials. So, you know, they didn't buy me expensive art supplies, but they, um, you know, they would give me stacks of paper or scraps of wood or fabric or my dad didn't know that I used his tools when he wasn't there, but, you know, things like 
that that, um, that allowed me to explore from an early age on. So as educators, you might be dealing with young children where you see these inclinations and it, it's important for you to be aware and perhaps encourage those inclinations. And then when I got in high school, my dad would buy me art books. Like, so if I express any interest in a particular artist or an art period, then he would buy me an art book for, you know, Christmas or birthday or something. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had a nice little stack of art books and I had some experience already in the arts. Um, and then I think the second important thing is, aside from parents, to have some kind of a professional to encourage that child or high school student or whatever. And um, that provides a student with the first insight into what the profession is about. So for me, it was a high school art teacher. So I watched what he taught, how he taught, how he got his education. Those things became important because I could see for myself, this might be an entry for me into the professional world. So for you as educators, again, whatever discipline you see a child leaning towards, I think that's critical to begin encouraging them. Or, you know, if they ask you questions about your profession, that's an opportunity for you to give them um, an additional push that their parents may not be able to, you can provide the modeling for those, um, those students. So let me go back to this uh, painting and talk a little bit about it because for the visual arts, it's all about seeing and sometimes artists cannot really verbalize what they're trying to convey. They just give you the end results. So let me just give you a, a an example of one of the great artists from the 20th century. And this is uh, Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, he was a Russian painter, went to Germany and worked with a very avant-garde German art movement. Uh, he was originally trained as a lawyer. So I think that's important for you to remember because the discipline of law and that type of mindset is very different than an artist. So for him to have been a practicing lawyer and then make this leap to visual arts is pretty amazing. So for Kandinsky, he, he um, retells this story about he was in an art gallery uh, late afternoon, sun was setting, there was a painting propped up against the wall and he walked over to it and could not understand what the subject matter was. He said he looked and looked and he couldn't see a subject matter. And that intrigued him and it inspired him. It was sort of one of those epiphany moments for him. So what he was actually looking at was one of Claude Monet's paintings of haystacks. And, you know, so I turned that, that uh, image on its side so you could get a sense of what Kandinsky must have felt. It was sort of a disorientation, not understanding what that image was. But it was one of Claude Monet, one of the great Impressionist haystack paintings. And so for Kandinsky, it wasn't the object of this pile of hay. It was the texture, the color, the lighting that inspired him. So Kandinsky, in his breakthrough moment, goes back and paints something like this. Does it look anything like Claude Monet's haystack? Does it have a subject matter? Not at all. And this is, Kandinsky is credited with creating the first non-objective art, so it doesn't have any subject matter. That is a major breakthrough in the 20th century for artists to say, I don't have to paint an object, I can paint color, light, texture, line, shape, without an image, without an actual subject matter. Um, so that is that, this idea of sort of the leaps that artists often take. They are presented with something, and then the mind sometimes makes these big leaps, and it, it's manifest in the tangible, the, the paint, the, um, the lines, the shapes. Um, I thought what I would do is tell you a little bit, and these are characteristics, and I think they're
particular stages in artist development. 